Good evening and welcome to TDM Talk Show. The city's unique heritage, history and urban landscape shapes and projects its identity. Our guest has been based in Macau for over a decade and has been delving into it through the lens of an anthropologist. He's also been studying heritage conservation in Southeast Asia. Peter Zabelskis is an associate professor of anthropology at the University of Macau's Department of Sociology. Professor Peter Zabelskis. Thank you. Welcome to the show and thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much. Happy uh, to be here. It's great uh, having you here and I'd like to uh, start by talking about your views as someone who's been based in Macau for about, so for 12 years actually, yes, since yes. 2006. You've witnessed dramatic transformations. Right, right. I think we all feel them and see them. There's a lot more buildings and a lot taller buildings. Mm -hmm. That's obvious. Some of that is very exciting. It's exciting to see all that stuff. But something else has changed that's a little hard to, to see sometimes. It's the feel of the city. Uh, in general, I think things have become a little less comfortable. A lot of Chinese people are interested in the idea of circulation, circulation of blood, circulation of qi, and of air. I think there's blockages in that circulation right now. Uh, people are less content and comfortable than they were 12 years ago. Uh, as, a, as a big generalization, it's exciting, there's more money, people are doing very well, but something is really being challenged, and that's sort of a, a quality of life. Uh, and the ability to see far into the distance, either physically or to see your own future developing, those choices seem to be limited by people. Uh, there are a lot of other smaller things that are very serious. I see a, uh, an extended inflation in the distance that you have to walk to the bus stop. They constantly move bus stations and uh, the general trend is to walk further to get to the bus. The bus leaves you further away from where you want to go. And this is all in the name of traffic, of vehicles moving. Similarly, whenever they change the road, it's always in favor of vehicular traffic, not pedestrians. There was once a beautiful crosswalk across the main street right in front of Macau Square. And if you needed to go to the other side, you could just walk and traffic would stop and you would go. They totally closed that. And now to walk across the street, you have to walk the equivalent of two or three blocks in the name of having the traffic speed up by 10 seconds or so. There's nothing wrong with having traffic slow down for people, but it's not people who are the priority. Similarly, there was a beautiful little park in sort of a traffic triangle in front of the Regency Hotel in Taipa. Yes. Beautiful, and people loved it. They tore it down and built a gas station. So my question is, what is a greater human need? Another gas station or a little bit of green and beauty as you're riding by that remains? So I question this. Uh, Yes, all of the casinos are exciting. They will be the monuments that we'll try to restore in the 22nd century, that kind of retro mm -hmm. amusement park stuff. But there's a lot of charm and environmental sustainability in the design of older ways of doing things that I think it's very easy to get lose sight of. Uh, those who cast a skeptical eye on what we've been witnessing um, somehow are truly concerned about not only issues of livability, but to something that would be even deeper, which is what one can call the soul of Macau, if exactly, I may say. Exactly, Do you share this concern? Yes, yes. That's really the heart of anthropology, is to think about things that are less tangible, that are expressed through tangible means, and the ways that the structures we create for ourselves physically and socially and politically either hamper or hinder the human spirit. So that's the questions I always think about. And I see a change for some, some good here, mm -hmm. but also something that's either stagnant or certainly change in development, development but maybe not progress. Uh, 
And your research has been focusing a lot on uh, anthropology of space. Actually, that is what you are already yes, hinting yes. at in your answers. Um, uh, uh, from the lens of an anthropologist, uh, what's your overall comment on, let's start by tangible heritage. Okay. And then intangible. Then. Okay. Well, in both cases, I think the view of anthropology is that there is so much more to the human spirit and creativity and productivity than thinking and worrying about business and the economy. You turn on any news program, look in any newspaper, the bulk of the attention is money and business and economics. That's only using part of your brain <laughs> as a human being. Uh, and methodologically, anthropology thinks of other ways of researching what it is that people do and think that can't be counted, such as quality of life and livability. Yes, you can count certain dimensions, but there are other things to the human spirit that are less easy to talk about, and governments don't necessarily understand. They understand the numbers and the buildings and the, the physical things, not the intangibles that are so important behind that. Would you make the case for more, uh, not only government officials, but let's say even advisors, uh, trained in social sciences, um, sociology, anthropology, uh, uh, would that somehow uh, make, have an impact somehow? Absolutely, I think it certainly would. We really need to study the social sciences. We've got the economic part down pretty well. There's money coming in. The world as a whole is richer than ever before. But of course, it's not distributed equitably. The gap between the rich and poor is getting stronger all the time. So it is the intangible things, the social structures that are real, but you can't necessarily see them in bricks and mortar uh, that we need to think about. We need to think about softer knowledge, softer ways of thinking that continue to sustain our world in a humane way. There's always this trend, tendency of monetizing uh, all, right. uh, heritage, uh, cultural industries, um, art. Uh, uh, you, can, you can see that happening yeah, here as well, yeah, right? Yeah. Well, what I'm saying is in China, you've got the bowls of rice covered basically now. Mm -hmm. We need to think about more important things than just physical sustainability, uh, survival and food. Basics are covered for most people. It's very good time to be alive, but we need to think about what we really want in all of this. So all this talk about, I don't know, the end of history or the end of ideologies, etc., uh, it's a mistake to, to rush into that conclusion, right? I don't think history will ever end. Yeah. <laughs> that is a wishful thought. Uh, we need to learn from history. There are certain good lessons to be learned from history that we seem to be forgetting. Uh, physically, one about sustainable architecture, a lot of our buildings were built in a way that need, needed no electricity, did not need air conditioning, high ceilings, ventilation. We can apply those lessons from the past to contemporary life and make that a goal. You arrived right after Macau, as the historic center has been inscribed as UNESCO's World Heritage. Yes. Um, what's your assessment of what's been done so far? Well, I don't, I, there's, of course, there's always more to be done. I think maybe Macau thought of getting the UNESCO designation as an end state, whereas other places think of it as a beginning, a catalyst for all sorts of heritage endeavors. And I don't see that happening in Macau. Uh, Macau has done very minimal things, as far as I'm concerned, about educating local people or visitors who, or whoever wants to know about our heritage, and not just for the point of tourist visitors. Uh, those signages around town on those brown steel columns are excellent, and they're in multiple language. They're very well done. Uh, they, they are unobtrusive. They let the site alone. But beyond that, so much more could be done in terms of community development and realizing that people need and want heritage and that identity of a place does not come from the top down. 
it bubbles up from the bottom. And that creative energy, that love for Macau that people feel, bubbling up as perennial Macau identity, of course it changes through time, but I think it's been challenged by the rapidness mm -hmm. of the development of large infrastructure projects. Uh, so you're making the case for bottom-up dynamics and community involvement in, yes. in this endeavor uh, when it comes to heritage, uh, not only conservation, but living heritage, right? Something yes, that will go yes. beyond the facade and the well-preserved exactly, buildings, right? Exactly. It depends on the material, but it is not material itself. But the material, when the Portuguese left, they rushed to preserve certain things, and they left empty, beautiful buildings. Now the theory of heritage preservation is to always think of the use of the building while you are preserving the physical structure, because otherwise it's just an empty theatrical shell. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think that was done. So there's always this talk about the uh, risk of, uh, I don't know if I'm using the word correctly, of Disneyfication, Disney like uh, sort of heritage Disneyland uh, with, uh, without true meaning inside it uh, and also um, pretty much focus on masterism, right? Yeah. Uh, do you see that happening or not yet? Well, of course, all those theme casinos in Kotai are examples of Disneyfication. Mm -hmm. But they are their own thing. They have their own visual and architectural excitement. But these are ironically referencing heritage. They themselves are not heritage. They will be the heritage of the 22nd century when we're, we're, we're doing something else with our public spatial symbolism. Mm -hmm. But uh, so that's fine. It's its own thing. Real heritage is something different, and, and it's authentic heritage, that's such a, a debatable word, but real heritage is a challenge to this Disneyfication. And in terms of scale, the Disneyfied theatrical heritage is sort of overwhelming the sense of the city, which is very limited in space, very delicate. Uh, as a place to live. Of course it's exciting as a tourist destination, but what does UNESCO heritage really do for local people living here? It might be challenging them by making the place too famous, and heritage itself is not enough to diversify the Macau economy. It's a very slender thread, very delicate, and to just distribute the congestion to other sites is not enough. So what, what do you think would be done to, 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 to take it to a higher level or to the <laughs> next step when it comes to seizing this opportunity of uh, having UNESCO listed heritage and then diversify it, not only vertically, but if possible, horizontally? Yeah, yeah. Well, that is a very big question. That is what requires thought. That's why is there seem to be need to be teams of social scientists who will be working on this problem. But I'd like to mention an example from Penang, how it's very different yes. there. Uh, Penang, when they got their World Heritage designation, the national government gave millions of dollars for community development projects that were heritage related. And one of the requirements was that the project had to be bottoms up. It had to be suggested by local residents, local people who then would be matched with experts and they would get the project done. Now, they also had a quite authoritarian top-down government, but their history was a little bit different. Each group felt sort of independent in Penang. They did their own thing. And now this is fed into a full understanding that bottoms-up organization can really work. And that is what is needed for heritage programs in Macau. And they say this is also true of environmental projects. The government alone cannot do this. It must be people involved. And so far I see people in Macau being either apathetic or letting the government decide too many things top down. And that's, as I said, that's not how identity works. R strong rooted identity bubbles up from the bottom. And this is your uh, latest book, um, Panang, and it's knowledge. It's networks, networks of, knowledge. of Networks of Knowledge. Yeah. 
Well, I realized in studying other port cities around the world and Penang is that most of the focus of research is on trade and economics and commerce. But cities are also great meeting points for ideas and dissemination of ideas and transformations of ideology, including religious ideologies and, and ways of life and lifestyles and greater personal freedoms in terms of gender relations. So I put together a collection of scholars who uh, all have written about Penang in one way or another. They're mostly historians and anthropologists. And the theme is how when people arrived in Penang, they traded things, they became hybrid. They changed their language, they changed their customs. It was a very early example of globalization at its best. And now that energy of multiple sources of authority is feeding into this, what they are doing with this global heritage designation from UNESCO. Someone in Penang wisely asked me, well, if it belongs to the world, does that mean it no longer belongs to us? Mm -hmm. And that is a question we can ask in Macau. That beautiful little sliver of UNESCO heritage, yes, it's good that it's recognized, mm -hmm. but that should be the starting point, not the end point as an achievement. It should be the catalyst for something else. And heritage cities attract people for many different reasons. They attract tourists, of course, that's all good, but we need to control the congestion that they bring. But we also need heritage to attract talent, to stay long term, to contribute to innovation and development in new, maybe unforeseen ways. And that is about livability and comfortableness of cities. And I think Macau needs to do more work in that direction. You mentioned networks of knowledge. Uh -huh. um, tell us about these networks that have been built pretty much as the outcome of a, of a bottom-up dynamics in Penang. Uh, and who are these people? Who are they? Where are they coming from? Are they sell, settling in Penang? Are they m mixing with the local community? How is that taking shape? Well, they've come from all over the world, especially Asia. Uh, and they kept their own identities. In many cases, they kept their own language. If you ask them who they are, they might say, first of all, I'm Hokkien, or I'm Teochew, or I'm Tamil. And they have multiple layers of identities. And the interesting thing about Penang is that everybody who lives there has the experience of being a minority in one way or another. Mm -hmm. Even top government people, they are a minority in Penang because it's largely a Chinese city. So I think this makes people very aware of the other. Combined with the British colonial legacy of indirect rule, letting each group do its own thing, maybe even enforce its own laws to a certain extent, that encouraged a, a bottom-up type identity process in the, the making of space in Penang. And that is tying in now to the best principles of urban sustainability, that it must come from the bottom up. Uh, Whereas in Macau, I'm wondering if it's still too much top down. It's maybe not as diverse as, as the, the tourist literature would like you to believe. There's a very dynamic Portuguese presence here. I've never seen so many Chinese people eating bread before. <laughs> there are many, many more Portuguese restaurants and locals enjoy them also. But it is still largely Chinese and uh, there's a different dynamic here that would require different solutions to keeping people feeling attached to a place because feeling you have a home in the world is very important. And I've done interviews with people and my colleagues have also. People are very disturbed about how Macau has not, leaves very little space to identify with uh, as, as a local. Sonata Square used to be a place to go to see and be seen on a weekend for locals. Now would you ever consider going there? It's, it's a place for tourism. So I don't know what the solution and is. And the traditional locally owned uh, shops and uh, small eateries, they're basically, most of them are gone. Yes, They yes. gave way to all yeah, those. Yeah. And even I had a friend from Hong Kong come here a couple years ago and he said, 
wow, there are little mom and pop grocery stores here, convenience stores. They're all gone from Hong Kong, he said, but we had them here. So that's the kind of thing that should be preserved. And I'm worried about the uh, herbal tea sellers around Sonato Square, how they've been able to hold out there. I'm wondering if they own those properties and they love what they do. So it's smaller things that need to be emphasized. And education for all, whoever wants to learn about Macau, including locals, including young people. One of the good things that they do in Penang is they involve youth groups in so many different things, traditional arts and performances, martial arts, singing, uh, heritage preservation, and they consult with people before massive projects are built. They had their fair share of damage. It's not an ideal world there either. There's a lot of politics going on in property development. But people there love their city. People love Macau in Macau. But somehow the history has been different. The political history of Penang has allowed people to feed in their energies and be heard by the government with the blessing of UNESCO. I'm not sure Macau understood the UNESCO designation in that way. We've seen uh, over the past 12 years, uh, at least for a couple of times, uh, UNESCO issuing uh, warnings uh, that it might end up uh, to the extreme, like delisting some of the sites, or and, and this had to do with property developments being planned in what one can call buffer zones, right? Right, right. That, that, that is still a concern, right? Oh, yes, yes. Well, there was that famous case of the, the Chinese embassy building going taller than the Gia Lighthouse, and there was a big outcry, and I, they did cut it down. Mm -hmm. But you, you can certainly you lose your UNESCO designation. And I'm concerned about that big electronic billboard at the foot of the steps of St. Paul, mm. which is totally inappropriate for that area. Uh, so the buffer zone is very important, but as I understand it in Macau, it's a very small buffer zone uh, uh, around the central area. Uh, you mentioned the Giat Lighthouse, which is an interesting case in point, because back then, I remember, there were some groups, uh, some of these associations and groups had just been established, uh, and the purpose was to save the Gear Lighthouse mm -hmm. was some sort of thing. And we did have um, a number of local Chinese citizens and associations, grassroots groups, right, right. looking at that had heritage as something that they truly uh, wanted to preserve in a way. And some people are saying it's like it's a, it's a watershed somehow in the relation between uh, at least part of the local Chinese community and heritage. Do you share this view? Yeah, well, they should be getting government grants. They're doing very good work in public service. Mm. Give them grants to maintain their work. The government cannot do everything. This is an example of bottom-up, but it needs support. We need more strong organizations like that. And something else has to do with the fact that, uh, well, most, or I wouldn't say most, but a sizable share of this heritage is from uh, the time of the Portuguese rule here in Macau. And looking at it not as Western or Portuguese heritage, but at, as Macau heritage that belongs to the people of Macau. Do you see that transition taking place in terms of the, their sense of belonging and the attachment uh, uh, in Macau? Well, I think the issue of anti-colonialism is different in Macau than in Penang. Mm -hmm. uh, it was very strong in Malaysia and Penang. And at the same time, English culture was much beloved by a lot of people there. Mm -hmm. Similarly, I think people here value Portuguese culture. I have a lot of Chinese mm -hmm. students, when they come up with a research project, they want to research something about Portuguese heritage in Macau. That is all good. So I think there's not much anti-colonial sentiment that's anti-Portuguese mm -hmm. here. It's, it's a delicate little flower that people cherish and they do value. Mm -hmm. It's just a question of the political will to keep that going. Mm -hmm. uh, as you know, Macau is it's thought to be a gateway to the Portuguese-speaking world, and that's certainly good. And heritage is a, is a, is a, is a great way to, 
to boost ties, right? Exactly, exactly. Because in one way, it's universal. You can see it and look at it. It's beautiful. Uh, may not depend on language skills. That is why material heritage is so compelling, because it is truly global. Mm -hmm. But it's the softer and tangible things that are harder to think about and manage well. I'd like you to elaborate a bit on intangible heritage. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, we can talk about uh, the Macanese cuisine, we can talk about uh, Cantonese opera. Well, it's like mm -hmm. it's not specifically mm -hmm. from Macau, but there is also a tradition here. We can talk about other customs, other traditions that are more unique to Macau. Uh, what do you think could be done to, 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 make, it, to make the intangible <laughs> heritage yeah. uh, ta more tangible to the people, uh, not only of Macau, but of tourists and uh, people from around the world? That's the hardest question of all. Uh, that requires a lot of thinking and research. But let me give it one example of that, something that I think is very important in tangible heritage in Macau. That is the idea that it's easy going here, that it's more laid back compared to Hong Kong. It's got to do with the way of life, right? Yeah, and people walk slower here than they do in Hong Kong. And I find that fascinating and interesting. And I think that's something that people really value. But I'm not sure they're able to keep going with this. Uh, People who have visited Macau long ago said it was a quiet little city. Mm -hmm. Well, you can't say that anymore. Uh, it's little, but it's getting tall and congested, and it's like there's this, some kind of structure overhead of air and infrastructure that is pounding on everyone and needs very careful management. Uh, something else has got to do also, and I think you did address that, at least partially, the issue of the very own economic model of Macau, uh, property prices skyrocketing, yeah, uh, rent-seeking yeah. political economic structure, right. gentrification making uh, inroads. Uh, that is a more structural problem and much yeah, harder to yeah. tackle, right? Gentrification is a big problem all over the world, and I don't know what can be done about it. Uh, as I said, the world as a whole has more wealth than ever before. Those billions of people that have been added to the population in the last decade have not been idle. They've been producing things, whether they're getting properly paid for it or not. So I think what Macau needs is rent control. I think that is one of the things that helped preserve the old inner city of Georgetown and Penang. Uh, prices here are outrageous. I don't think it should be any, everyone's goal in life to own their own home. That is a, a different kind of security, uh, requiring a whole social structure of personal economics that some people may not feel they want to be a part of, a regular salary, regular monthly mortgage payments. So there should be opportunities for small-scale businesses, people living near or in their own places of business, needing less communication, less uh, transportation. You don't have to have a car in Macau, obviously. It's such a small place. But when you do have money, what do you want? You want that. Because of all these policies that are disfavoring pedestrians and encouraging you to get a car. One last question. <laughs> uh, well, there will be many, but are there or is there a silver lining down the road looking at all these transformations uh, when it comes to heritage conservation and turning the city into a more livable place? Well, money is not health. Real wealth is not necessarily real health. But money can do a lot to make you happy. We can invest our money in Macau in better ways that are more people-oriented. Great things are done with health care and things like that, but we need attention to public transportation, electric vehicles, sustainable forms of energy, all of that. So Macau is in a very fortunate position of having an economic surplus. It's actually incredible when I tell people in the U.S. of all this government benefits and uh, cash handout and government surplus, they're amazed. That money could be good, put to good use in making lives of Macau people more comfortable rather than just 
having the first thought be economic development. We've got that already. And with this, uh, we wrap up our talk, Professor Peter Zvelskis. Thank you very much for joining us. Okay, thank you. Pleasure to have you on the show and the fascinating stuff. Thank you. And to you at home, thanks for tuning in. We'll be back next week.